Welcome to the reading of the book from E.W. Kenyon, The Two Kinds of Life. First words. The whole human race is facing a new era. Civilization is in a state of flux. Sense knowledge has failed again. It has destroyed what revelation knowledge has accomplished in the last four centuries. Sense knowledge has never produced a civilization that it did not destroy, nor given a monetary system that did not enslave the masses, nor originated an educational system that did not corrupt the spirit of youth. Sense knowledge has gained the supremacy over Christianity and dominates it. The mass of humanity has lost God and knows not how to find Him. Civilization has failed because the type of Christianity we have given it has failed. It was a sense-ruled type that was stripped of miracles. We believe that this book has the solution of the individual problem, the national problem, and the world problem. This is not a new philosophy. It is an unveiling of a lost truth, the most vital of all that God gave to us in Christ. Please read this with tolerance, yet with an open mind. It has the solution of the problems which the church is facing today. A definition. Eternal life is the nature of God. Jesus gave us the first intimation of what this life would do for man. John 1.4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Greek word is zoe, the new kind of life that Jesus brought to the world. In John 10.10, he said, I am come that ye might have zoe and have it abundantly. Man was to have a right to enjoy an abundance of a new kind of life. There are four Greek words translated life, or manner of life, in the New Testament. The first one is suke, which means natural, human life. The second is bios, which means manner of life, customs. The third is anostrophe, which is used seven or more times in the New Testament, and means a confused behavior, young. Galatians 1, 9 through 15 illustrates it, For ye have heard my behavior in times past in the Jews' religion how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and made havoc of it. It is a strange thing that the church has majored manner of life or behavior rather than eternal life, which determines in a very large way the manner of life. Receiving eternal life is the most miraculous incident or event in life. It is called conversion, the new birth, and the new creation. Some have called it getting religion. It is, in reality, God imparting His very nature substance, and being to our human spirits. Second Corinthians five seventeen and 18 describes it, Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he is, or there is, a new creation, or a new person. The old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new, but all these things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself. This is a miraculous recreation of man. It is God actually giving birth to a new man. The new creation, then, is a miracle thing. It is man receiving a foreign nature that recreates his spirit and makes him a new species among men. The church has never majored this new creation fact. Its leaders have never realized the possibilities that this new nature offers to men. None of the old religions of the world have ever changed the nature of their followers. India has two of the great religions of the East, so have China and Japan but they have never changed the natures of their followers. They did not impart to man a new element. Christianity gives to man God's very own nature. Chapter 1. A Biological Discovery Biology is a study of life in all of its varied forms and manifestations. It knows much of mineral life, metal life, vegetable life, animal life, and human life. But another life, the mother of all life, has been ignored by both scientists and modern thinkers. Its effect upon humanity is one of the miracles of human experience. Jesus promised it. John 10.10 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Contrast of two words. There are two Greek words which are translated life. One is suke, which means natural human life, and the other is zoe, eternal life, or God's life. This new kind of life is God's nature. It is called eternal life in the word. This life produces certain changes in man. People can see the effect at once of this life in a man, in his habits, his speech. It changes conduct and corrects habits and forms new ones. The people who have it are known as the twice-born men, the new creation men. Its effect on the lives and habits and qualities of people is often amazing. Boys and girls who receive it in their teens seldom, if ever, sow wild oats. There are no child criminals who have it. No girls in houses of prostitution have it. No drunkards have it. No confirmed cigarette users have it. No criminals have it. 
No crooks or thieves or crooked politicians have it. First John 3.15 says, And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The saloon men and barkeepers do not have it. Infidels and agnostics do not have it. The cultured scholastic agnostic knows nothing of it. A significant fact, if the men and women who are spending their time and money in philanthropic efforts to help the less favored knew what eternal life did for men, it would change their whole outlook on philanthropy. When criminals and the lawless receive eternal life, they become law-abiding citizens and worthy examples in society. Thieves become honest. Drunkards become sober. No case is incurable. It destroys the cause of friction in homes and every department of life. In all walks of life, it eliminates selfishness and in its place gives a new kind of love and a new outlook on life. What it does, the new kind of life recreates man. It makes him actually a new creation. Paul expresses it, Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, there is a new creation, or new species. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The worst criminals become evangelists and preachers. The most godless of men become faithful husbands and fathers. The gambler and the outcast become clean, worthy citizens. More facts. Children born of parents who have received this new life and have walked in the light of it are never found among criminals. Take this as an illustration. Here is a father and mother who have never received eternal life. They have two children. Then they receive eternal life. Several children are born to them. As the children grow up, you can see a vast difference in them. The first two lack some element of fineness of spirit. They are hard to discipline. They have no religious inclinations. The other children respond to religious training. They are eager after the things that go with eternal life. They are different. There is a refinement and culture in their spirits that the others do not have, though they are born of the same parents. The first two children sow their wild oats. They are hard to discipline. The children born after the parents received eternal life never sow wild oats and are easier to discipline. They have finer intellects. Another remarkable feature, boys and girls in the teens who receive eternal life and have an opportunity to let that life dominate their lives are 10 to 50 percent more mentally efficient than they were before. Something comes into them that affects their mental processes and governs their morals. You cannot find one boy or girl who has eternal life in a house of correction for juveniles. Hardly a boy or girl whose parents had eternal life and walked in the light of it before the children were born and while they were growing are juvenile criminals. I have said enough if it is true to change the attitude of social workers toward the criminal world. Crime is increasing. The youth of our nation are hard to restrain. Parental discipline is often ignored. Why? Because something has been lost out of our theological institutions and pulpits and schools. It is the knowledge of eternal life. What is eternal life? Eternal life is the nature of God. Jesus said, I am come that ye might have life, Zoe, and have it abundantly. John 1, 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That seems strange. Read it over again. Notice that the life that was in Christ has become the light of civilization, has caused the mental development and the creative ability in man. No heathen country has ever needed a patent law or copyright law until eternal life was brought to them. The creative genius of the Anglo-Saxon race sprang into being in the second generation after they had received eternal life. Eternal life is the creative nature of God, and we have come to recognize the fact that man is a spirit created in the image and likeness of God. And who can receive God's creative nature? Eternal life is the creative nature of God, and we have come to recognize the fact that man is a spirit created in the image and likeness of God, and who can receive God's creative nature. Man was created to be the eternal companion of God. Quoting from Psalm 8, an eminent Hebrew scholar said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, that thou hast made him but a shadow, a shade lower than God, and crowned him with glory and honor? That was the original man, the first man. He was made as nearly like God as God could create a being. Man is an eternal being. Now you can understand that he is in God's class. He was created so that he could receive the nature of God and become God's actual child. Now you can see the genius of God. God wanted a companion. He wanted children, but he wanted to glorify man, so he gave him the privilege of being the parent of his children. God planned originally that man should become a partaker of his divine nature. When man committed that unthinkable crime of high treason in the garden, he forfeited his right to the nature of God and became the partaker of the nature of God's enemy. That nature is called spiritual death as opposed to God's nature, spiritual life. 
One produces crime, misery, murder, mortality, and death. The other gives life and love and light, unselfishness. These are the sweet fruits of the recreated spirit. One makes earth a hell, while the other produces heaven on earth. Now we can understand, in him was life, and that life is the light, the development of man, John 1, four. That life has given to us the best that is in our civilization. It has given to us all our mechanical and chemical discoveries and inventions. Man is a spirit. For a long time, we were puzzled about the creative element in man. We early saw that it would not come from reasoning faculties because they received all their impulses and knowledge from the five senses. Where was the ability that produced poetry? It came flooding our minds with beautiful rhythm and couplets of words that we had never used before. From where did the music come that thrilled us? Harmonies, melodies, symphonies, orchestrations. Where did they come from? They weren't reasoned out. They simply came floating into our consciousness from a source we did not know. It was something with which our imaginations were unacquainted. It came forth as something new in the form of intricate machinery. This didn't come by experimentation, as we have achieved it, in chemistry. Where did those pictures of marvelous art come from that we see in drawings and paintings? They came from the human spirit. Eternal life is given to man's spirit, the part of him that is recreated or born again. And this human spirit is the creative element in man. When the spirit receives eternal life, it begins a war against the senses that rule the mind that has received all of its impulses from the human body. It demands ascendancy over the mind. This takes place as the mind is renewed and comes into harmony and fellowship with a recreated spirit. All creative ability is in the human spirit. Sense knowledge has never produced an inventor. Sense knowledge can only experiment and follow the blueprints of the recreated human spirit. Now we understand why there are no inventors in heathen lands. Man must first receive the creative nature of God. Chapter 2 The Greatest Biological Fact in Human Experience God is the designer and creator of the universe. Men who have studied botany, biology, metallurgy have been amazed at the ability of the creator. The creative the inventive genius of God staggers the human reason. It would not be strange, then, if man, who is in God's class, could receive this creative energy in the new birth. Some of us have come to recognize that the human spirit is the fountain out of which all the creative energy flows. We recognize the fact that pure human reason, or sense knowledge, has never produced an inventor or a great poet, or a creator in any department of human culture. India, Japan, and China naturally have as fine intellects as the Anglo-Saxons, and yet they have never invented or created a new thing for thousands of years until Christianity has been carried to them. The same fact applies to the Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, and Scandinavian peoples. They never invented, they never created anything until they received eternal life. This fact gave me a mental shock when I first saw it. Then the question came, what is there about this eternal life that caused men to become inventors, scientists, chemists, and biologists? Natural human reason, or sense knowledge, had made philosophers of men. But what is philosophy? It is a vain search for reality. No philosopher ever found it. The philosopher cannot find anything outside of himself unless it comes from some other being. Aristotle and other philosophers of Greece did not give to the world a civilization. They did not give to the world a great educational system, nor an age of electricity or mechanics. They didn't discover. They never created. The fact is, they did not give us anything except mental concepts and theories. It is a remarkable thing that when a man receives eternal life and allows it to develop in him, his creative energy is at once awakened. It changes his mental processes. It quickens his sense of perception. All the knowledge that we have in our colleges, universities, and technical schools has come to us through the five senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and feeling. Man has no means of gaining knowledge except through these five channels. The limitations of sense knowledge are apparent to every thinking man. He cannot know beyond the contacts that he makes with these five senses. Sense knowledge men have never made creators, inventors, or chemists. They cannot find God. They cannot find the human spirit. They cannot find the reason for man, the source of life or motion. Sense knowledge carries them to the frontier of human investigation, but can take them no further. 
Then revelation knowledge comes to their rescue. God imparts to the man of the five senses his own nature. This recreates his human spirit and reacts upon his thinking processes. In our investigation, we have proven that when young people receive eternal life, it increases their mental efficiency from 10 to 50 percent, in many cases more than 100 percent. If the new convert is properly instructed in the Word, taught to act upon it, taught to depend upon the God which has come inside of him, taught his privileges and rights in prayer, and taught his rights as a son in the Father's family, his mental efficiency increases amazingly. We have discovered that the human spirit is the source of all creative energy, that it does not come from the reasoning faculties. It directs them. No nation has ever needed a patent law or copyright law until it received eternal life. They can follow blueprints. They can imitate. They can take one of our machines apart and build from it, but they cannot create a machine. Natural man can only learn by experimentation. Sense knowledge has no other means of learning except by imitation or experimentation. It is said that Edison experimented over 3,000 times before he arrived with our electric light. The natural human spirit is not creative, but when this creative nature of God comes into it, it at once has creative possibilities. All it needs is to be developed. This is not a theory. This is an absolute fact. It is the most revolutionary fact connected with biology. Some Biological Miracles I used to wonder what it was that made some who had been criminals such enthusiastic Christians. I knew that there was nothing in the forgiveness of sin that would do it. I knew that if all God did for a man was to forget his past, to pardon it, the man would go on and have another past. Forgiveness has no power to change a man's nature. Then I found out about eternal life. You may take the worst crook who ever walked in the underworld of our great cities. Let him receive eternal life, and he will become at once an honorable, trustworthy person. Religion will not do it, but eternal life does. Take the habitual criminal. The moment he receives eternal life, his days of crime are over. Go through our penal institutions. You cannot find an habitual criminal who has eternal life. If they have received eternal life, they are no longer criminals. There are no habitual drinkers who have eternal life. Eternal life changes their nature. The chronic hobo who lives in the jungle of our big cities becomes an honest laborer when he receives eternal life. No boys or girls who receive eternal life ever become criminals. Here is the greatest biological fact that has ever confronted the scientific mind. If what we have just said is true, and it is true, we have discovered the secret of changing the morals of men and women. By morals, we mean conduct. Scientists have been searching to find some method whereby they could change criminals into honest men. This is the secret. Solves labor problems. It is also the solution of the labor and capital problem. The capitalist who has received eternal life and walks in the word can never take advantage of his employee. It would end the labor strikes and strife. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have an intelligent understanding of this problem? We are spending millions to solve the problem of labor and capital. We have built up an army of labor racketeers. Many of them, according to reports, come from the underworld. They saw an opportunity of victimizing the laboring man and at the same time to extort money from the manufacturer. All this would stop being. This is not a theory, not philosophy, metaphysics, or psychology. This is real Christianity, the thing that Jesus brought to the world. We have in our factories and our great industries multitudes of people who can follow blueprints. You will find in the majority of cases that those with creative ability have received eternal life or else have parents or grandparents who had it. Its effects on children. The children of parents who have received eternal life are mentally superior to those of parents who have not received eternal life. They are more easily influenced to accept Christianity than are those who have come out of irreligious homes. You can very seldom find a criminal whose parents had received eternal life before he was born. Following the World War, the United States government made a thorough investigation of the leaders of our great business organizations, like the Sugar Trust, the Steel Trust, etc., they discovered that 30% of these great leaders were the sons of clergymen and that 25% of them were the sons of lawyers, doctors, bankers, and college professors. Do you see the reaction of eternal life upon the descendants of those who have received it? We have one family in the United States that has produced hundreds of criminals. We have other families such as the Adams family and the Scudder family and the Edwards family that have turned out hundreds of leaders of society and almost no criminals. Why? because they were the children of men and women who had received the life and nature of God.
who are new creations, what it means to the individual. The new creation is the most outstanding miracle of human experience. To think that a man can receive into his spirit the very nature and life of God is an incredible thing to the natural mind. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Now the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them, because they are spiritually understood. The natural mind receives all its impulses and knowledge from the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. There is no other means for the natural man to obtain knowledge. His spirit is not responsive to divine things. God cannot reveal things to him. He cannot understand spiritual things. Consequently, the only knowledge the natural man can receive is that which has come through his or someone else's five senses. All the knowledge we teach in our colleges, universities, and technical schools comes from the five senses. We are making a distinction between sense knowledge and revelation knowledge, between the natural or physical man and the spiritual man. I do not condemn the natural man because he doubts miracles or because he doubts the Bible. It would be a perfectly normal thing for him to do this because he cannot understand them. They are in a realm above him. Natural man is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you did he make alive when ye were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein ye once walked according to the course of this age, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and were by nature children of wrath. Death here means union with Satan, a partaker of the satanic nature. I know that some of you who read this will be shocked by it. I was at first and thought I could never tell it to anyone. It is like a cancer or TB or any other deadly disease. It is not nice to talk about, but it must be faced. Spiritual death has to be faced. That is the reason Jesus came, to give man, who was spiritually dead, a new nature. God is love. When God imparts his nature to us, we have a love nature. The Effect on the Home Do you see what this would mean in a home? In a home where the husband and wife have lived very unhappily, have quarreled and had their continual differences, there is a great need of this new kind of life. It is more than likely that they would have separated had it not been for the children. Now they have both received eternal life. They have discovered the new way of life. They no longer quarrel. The things that caused their differences before have ceased to be or are passed over without friction. They have new natures. The effect on the children. The effect on the children is tremendous. One little boy said, Papa, what has happened to you and Mama? You don't fight anymore. You haven't sworn at me for a long time. What is it, Daddy? The father took him in his arms and said, Son, I have received eternal life. I am a Jesus man now. That new life changes everything. Children who grow up in this atmosphere seldom grow wrong. They are guarded from it by something within them. It is deeply important that every man and woman who is thinking of marriage and of a family should consider this question. Have I a right to bring children into the world until I, myself, have received eternal life? This is a problem for the prospective father and mother to solve. You will have a higher type of children. They will be more easily governed. They will be more trustworthy. Even if they do not become Christians, they will always bear the mark of their parents' union with Christ. It means a happier home, but it also means something else. It means that your life comes into fellowship with the father's life. It means that you have God as your father and that you are his child. It means that you have God's ability to assist you in life's fight. Chapter 3 The Need of Eternal Life The subject of eternal life can well be called another lost truth. The church has never majored eternal life, and yet it was the reason for Christ's coming. John 10.10 10, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. The word life used here is from the Greek word zoe. It is the word used in connection with eternal life. The other word suke means natural life and all other forms of life. Man is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1 And you did he make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins. Spiritual death is the nature of the adversary. When Adam sinned in the garden, he became a partaker of satanic nature. This nature has been the cause of all the sin, misery, and sickness of the human race. It has given to man an inferiority complex, a sense of unworthiness, a sense of sin. It has given him hatred and jealousy and bitterness. 
All the crimes and miseries of the ages are the result of this nature that man possesses. The reason that man cannot stand right with God is that his nature is enmity against God. Romans 8, 7 tells us that it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. This nature must be taken out of man, and a new nature must be given to him. Our popular Christianity is the product in part of the Dark Ages. It is not the Christianity of the Pauline epistles. Consequently, there is much said about sin and repentance for sin, but there is little said about eternal life. If it were possible for God to forgive a sinner his sins, it would do him no good, because he would go on sinning. The thing that the sinner must have is a new nature. He must be recreated. This recreation can only be accomplished by imparting to him a new nature. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 We become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. That corruption is spiritual death. We only escape it by the new birth, receiving this new nature. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 20, 30-31, Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life in his name. John 1, 4, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus came to bring to man a new nature, eternal life. Until man has this new nature, he is living in the realm of spiritual death and he is a subject of Satan. Ephesians 2.12, that ye were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He is alienated from the life of God. He cannot come into God's presence. He cannot fellowship with God. His nature is enmity against God. His only hope lies in a new creation. In John 5.24, Jesus said, He that heareth my word, and believeth him that sent me, hath eternal life, and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death into life. The one who receives eternal life passes out of the realm of death, Satan's dominion and realm, into the realm of life. There is no judgment for the man who has passed out of Satan's realm into God's realm. He passes out of death into life. It is an actual birth out of Satan's family into God's family. It is mentioned in Colossians 1.13, who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That is the new birth. 2 Corinthians 5.17 and 18. Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new. But all these things are of God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ. This is an actual transition of man from Satan's family into God's family. When he accepts Christ as Savior and confesses Him as Lord, God breathes into him eternal life. That drives out the satanic nature and makes him a new creation. With the new creation, there comes a new mode of life. 1 John three fourteen and 15 We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. The new life that has come into us is God's life. God is love, so it is a new love that has come into our life. He that loveth not abideth in death. He has never yet been born again. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Christianity is not a religion. It is not joining a church. It is not having your sins forgiven. It is receiving the nature of God, eternal life. Until one does receive eternal life, he is not a child of God. We are children, not by adoption only, but by an actual birth of our spirits. When you accept Christ as Savior and confess Him as your Lord, God gives you eternal life, His own nature. That eternal life is imparted to your spirit. Your spirit is made a new creation. The spirit begins to react upon the mind, and the mind, as it meditates and practices the Word, becomes renewed. The mind is recreated. It gets a new sense of God, a new vision, and it can understand the Word now and enjoy it. Before the Word was dark, mysterious, and uninteresting, now it is a living thing. John 6, 63. The words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and they are life. John six forty seven. He that believeth hath eternal life. You can see the distinction here between mental assent that says, Yes, I know that eternal life belongs to me, and real faith that says, I know that I have eternal life. 
When we believe or act on the word, we become possessors of eternal life. We pass out of Satan's dominion into the family of God. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, even unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. The eleventh and twelfth verses read, And the witness is this, that God gave unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath the life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. The philosophical and metaphysical religions have no eternal life. They simply revamp the natural with some new theory of life. The men and women who accept these religions have never been born again. They are spiritually dead, though they may have become very religious. The natural man can become very religious. His spirit nature hungers after God, and it reaches out after anything that seems to help and bring him into a better spiritual condition. However, he cannot find or know God until he receives God's nature, until he becomes a child of God by an actual birth. Receiving eternal life is very simple. We know, according to Isaiah 53, 6, that God laid our iniquities upon Jesus. All we like sheep had gone astray, and Jehovah laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was God's substitute for the human race. We know that Jesus bore our sins and diseases in his body on the tree. We know that he was manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We know that by that one sacrifice of himself, he satisfied the claims of justice and put sin away and made it possible for man to become a new creation, the righteousness of God in Christ. John 1.12, For as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 10, 9-11 tells us that if we take Jesus Christ as Savior, confess Him as our Lord, and believe that God raised Him from the dead, God immediately takes us to be His children and gives us eternal life. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With his lips he makes confession of his salvation. You make this confession, I have taken Him as my Savior. I have confessed Him as my Lord. God has taken me to be His child and has given me his righteousness, and eternal life. This perfectly harmonizes with 2 Corinthians 5.21. Him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Eternal life makes him righteous. Eternal life makes him a lover. Eternal life makes him a father pleaser. Eternal life is the most important thing in life today. It is not a question of whether one is a church member or whether one has been confirmed or baptized. The real issue is, have you received eternal life? If you have, you are God's child. If you have not, you may be a minister, you may be a bishop or a pope, but you are still spiritually dead, without God and without hope. One needs to meditate in the scriptures until the new creation fact becomes a living reality. When you know you are a new creation, you know that Satan has no dominion over you. You know that Colossians 1, 13 and 14 is absolutely true who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have our redemption, the remission of our sins. The new birth is an actual transition out of Satan's authority and dominion. Satan has no legal right to reign over the new creation. Romans 6.14 is not only a classic, but it is a tremendous truth, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Another translation says, For sin shall not lord it over you, Sin's power over you is Satan's power. Satan has been dethroned. He belongs to the dethroned powers. Your redemption means the breaking of Satan's dominion. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have our redemption, the remission of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Your redemption made possible the new creation. The new creation is under the lordship of Jesus. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is the Lord of the new creation. He is the supplier of every need. He is the protector. He is the shepherd Lord. You need to meditate on this truth until it burns in your very being, until when sickness lays hold upon your body, you say with certainty, Disease cannot touch the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is the temple of God. God dwells in this new creation. He is my Father. I am His child. Disease cannot reign over His body. I am not my own. This body belongs to my Lord. I am a custodian of it. As a custodian... I refuse to have disease in my body, to dishonor the indwelling presence of my Lord. We must become new creation conscious before we were sin conscious and failure conscious. Now we become God conscious and son conscious. We know that we have the strength of God in us, the life of God, the very substance and being of God. 
has become part of our spirits. We know that we have a right to associate in fellowship with the Father on terms of utter equality, because Jesus is our righteousness, and we, by this new creation, have become the righteousness of God in Him. The new creation should never be under condemnation. If sin comes, we should confess it, put it away, and walk on with Him. The new creation has an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, nine. This leaves us in the Father's presence as clean and as pure as though we had not sinned. The new creation is not a servant. The new creation is a son. Galatians 4, 6, and 7. So thou art no longer a bondservant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The new creation takes a son's place in the Father's heart and lives as a son of God among men. He is now an ambassador on the behalf of Christ. He is a representative of the new race of men. 1 John 5.13 becomes a reality in the heart. These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Even unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, you have the very nature and life of God in you. The knowledge of this fact gives one a quietness, a sense of oneness with God. You are one with Him, just as that bay is one with the ocean, because the tides flow into the bay. God's nature flows into you. You are linked with God. God and you are identified. Healing, strength, success, and victory are all part of this new creation life that has been made a reality by God's imparting His nature to us.